Good morning, everyone. I will now call this meeting to order. I am Representative Steve Barrar, Majority Chairman of the House Veteran Affairs and Emergency Preparedness Committee and co-chair of the SR6 Commission. I want to welcome you all to Chester County, and I have the privilege of representing a part of this county, but not the part that, um, that we're sitting in right now. This is either Harry Lewis's or Tim Hennessy's is in this area. Um, as far as I can think of. Um, at this time, I would like to ask um, Ed Mann, our retired fire commissioner, to um, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask everyone to stand for a minute, a moment of silence for um, the firefighters and, and first responders that we've lost over the, the years. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Nate, would you take the attendance, please? Yes. Senator Vlakovich is not here, but I am here in his, uh, his stead. Chairman Barrar? Here. Sean Harris uh, is the director for the for the House. Senator Cost is not here. Ron Jumper is here. Uh, Representative Sonato is not here yet. Uh, for the Senate Caucus, uh, Michelle Brooks is not here, but Diane McNaughton I saw is here. Again, for the, the Senate Democrat uh, Caucus, Fire Caucus, Ron Jumper is here. Frank Ferry, I believe, is on the phone. On its way in, uh, Representative Domkos is not here yet. Fire Commissioner Bruce Trago is here. Uh, Ray Bereshansky for the Department of Health is here. County Commissioner Association Mark Hamilton is here. Uh, President of the Municipal Pennsylvania Municipal League Peter Malone. No, okay. Burroughs Association Bill Rossi. Or Ed Troxel, okay. State Association of Township Commissioners, John Kunselman. State Association of Township Supervisors, Cheryl Barnhart. Here. And Dave Sanko is here as well. Council of Governments, Steve Baer. Here. Fire and Emergency Services Institute, Don Conkle. Here. Firemen's Association of State, James Karstater. Here. County Firemen's Association from the West, Harold Weil. From the Central, Ed Mann. Here. From the East, Bo Crowding. Here. From the Southeast, Greg J. Kapowski or Tom Garrity. Here. Professional Firefighters Association, Art Marninovska. Career Fire Chiefs, Jay Delaney. Uh, hazard uh, material technicians, Joe Landis or Rich Wagner, I don't believe are here. Bill Genoway, he'll be late. Frank Zangari. Daryl Jones from the city of Pittsburgh. John Bast uh, from the city of Easton. Emergency Health Services Council, Dave Jones or Jeanette Swade. Ambulance Association, Don DeRamus and Heather Scharr. Here. Barry Albertson. Here. Jeff Gooch. Jerry Ozog. Here. Josh Wiegand. Kim Holman. Here. Charles McGarvey. Here. Steve McKinnis. Craig Nace. And auxiliary folks, uh, Pat Berger is not here. Uh, I believe there was a representative from the LBFC. Yeah, Brian. Thank you. Sean Sanderson from GCD. Here. And we're all set, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, everyone, for um, taking the time to be here today. This is in a very, very important commission that we have here in front of us. Um, I look forward to another productive meeting today. And the focus of today's meeting will be to roundtable the work and discussions of our subcommittees as we work to pare down our issues and recommendations, and there are quite a few of them there. Before we break out into um, further subcommittee discussions, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Bobby Cagle, the Director of Chester County Emergency Services and the Chester County EMA um, facility staff for the hosting us here today at their magnificent training center. Um, I also want to thank um, Bo Crowding for <clears throat> working with my staff on the logistics of today's meeting. As the um, point of contact for this facility, we look forward to touring your facility after we conclude our, our scheduled meeting today. And again, I'd like to thank you all for hosting us here today and for the breakfast spread that we have. And also, we'll have a lunch for you um, today. And I always call it a Delaware County lunch. There'll be strombolis from the family that actually um, invented the stromboli, hoagies, cheesesteaks, and some pizza. So, um, you know, we should have lunch right around noon here. Um, Don Cagle, um, Director Cagle, I mean, do you want to say a few words? Thank you, Chairman Barrar, uh, and good morning, everybody. I'm Bobby Cagle. I'm the Director of Emergency Services here in Chester County, and uh, welcome to the Chester County Public Safety Training Campus. Uh, it's a, as, as the representative said, we're very proud of, of our facility here. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time, just, just real briefly. Um, every opportunity I get to go out and talk to our municipal leaders uh, and our elected officials, and I realize I'm preaching to the choir a bit here, but I, I talk about how emergency services is truly in a state of crisis, and I want to thank you for the work that you're doing to, to try and help solve this, whether it's, it's the decline in volunteerism, uh, issues with recruitment and retention or funding. Uh, it's, it's such an important issue in Chester County and across the Commonwealth that uh, at the county level, we're actually looking at ways to incorporate it into our, into our strategic business planning, our managing for results process. You know, Chester County was one of the first counties in Pennsylvania to incorporate a, a strategic planning process. We're looking at ways to, to address this, this emergency services crisis in our, in our plan. Um, and, and, you know, we, we look at, at the, the evolving threat landscape that continues to, to change, even, even to the point of opioids and how that really impacts uh, emergency services across the Commonwealth. Um, this facility that we're, that we're standing in uh, and, and the entire campus here, the 95 acres of, uh, of property that we have here in South Coatesville Borough, uh, is really evidence of the tremendous support from our elected officials and, and, more, and, and primarily our county commissioners. Uh, there's about $400,000 of state funding that actually helped construct this facility, about $3 million of federal funding, uh, and the, the lion's share, the, the total cost of this, of this campus was $36 million that was borne primarily by the taxpayers of Chester County uh, because public safety is so important to our commissioners. Uh, our commissioners have invested more than $100 million over the last 10 years in public safety, which is uh, absolutely incredible, uh, providing all of the communications equipment to our emergency responders and, and really looking at ways that we can, we can better fund our emergency responders uh, so they can, they can take the, the funding that they get from fundraising and, and other uh, relief funding and, and put it to, to better use. Um, the, the fire training program that we have here in Chester County, uh, what, one, of the, the, one of the primary uses of, of this facility along with law enforcement and EMS training and emergency management training, but we do about 70 programs a year with about 1,200 graduates. It costs Chester County about a million dollars to put on uh, training, and, and all of that's county funded. Uh, the, the commissioners foot that bill. Um, we, don't, we don't get any state money, any federal money to be able to do that. And we're very fortunate in Chester County to be able to, to not only have the elected official support, but also the resources to be able to put on that kind of training. Uh, you know, any, any support, I, I know everybody's always looking for more money, but any support that we can always get uh, in, in terms of that is, is always welcome. Uh, I, I know that there's a number of bills that are, and, and, and uh, solutions that are being considered. One of them happens to be uh, the, octo or the, uh, the kind of partnering with the, the high school programs and the Department of Education. Just down the hall here on the left, uh, we've got a, a terrific example of, of a successful program working. Uh, with the Octorera Area School District and uh, 
you know, half the, half the day of, uh, of, of high school students are actually spent here getting all of the training that they need, uh, and then they go back to high school, and when they graduate high school, they've, they've got all of the training that they need, and uh, we're, we're doing it here in Chester County. Uh, EMS billing, a, another huge issue for us and, and something that we're, we, we, we very much consider. Um, I'm not sure why we just don't make it a crime to keep the money, um, you know, that, that, that folks aren't providing that insurance money directly to, uh, to the EMS services. But uh, with that, I, I really want to just say thank you for being here. Uh, I hope you, you have a productive session. Uh, I'll be around all day if you need anything, and uh, enjoy the tour, and thanks for all that you're doing. Thank you. And I, I will give the um, county commissioners kudos. They do, they are very committed to um, the emergency management here. The money they spend, um, you know, is, is extremely impressive. Um, next, I'd like to recognize a few people to make some brief opening um, comments. And um, Nate Silcox, um, standing in for Senator Volokovich, who is the co-chair of the committee, along with myself. Um, in all fairness, um, Senator Volokovich isn't here. He's over in the Pittsburgh area. Um, on the other side of the state, I did not make his last meeting, and um, so you know we've tried to do these meetings around the state, but it's always it's not always convenient to um, get out, and, and especially when you have to travel four or five hundred miles to make a meeting, it can be rather difficult. So, Nate, please, Mr. Chairman, thank you for that uh, uh, the time, and, and thank you for mentioning Senator Volokovich. He uh, spoke with him this morning again. He expressed his regrets for not being able to make it out for this meeting. Uh, the one thing that he asked uh, the committees to consider as, as you're moving forward in your deliberations, I believe he, he mentioned at, at our last meeting on February 2nd, is an in inventory and, and ways we can go about an in inventory. We've talked about the number of 300,000 uh, volunteer firefighters back in the 1970s, and now we're down to the 50,000 number. So he's trying to get a, a good grasp on, you know, what is the true number of volunteer firefighters right now and whether we have to differenti differentiate between active and social uh, et cetera on that front, uh, but ways that we can go about getting an accurate number on that front as well as equipment, much like we did uh, during the 911 reauthorization Pima uh, in that legislation was required to do an inventory uh, throughout each of our counties. This is going to be a little bit deeper uh, into getting our municipal fire departments, but again, I'd ask that each of the uh, committees take a look at that to see whether there's any recommendation on how we can go about finding a better answer on that front. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you. Um, the House Fire Caucus Co-Chairman, Frank Ferry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, sorry I was a little late in this tour of Coatesville. Um, saw many streets that I've never seen before. So uh, my GPS took me through town. But anyways, um, appreciate everyone taking the time to be here again today as uh, we continue to move forward with this, uh, these important tasks and uh, look forward to just getting the meeting started so we can get forward. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, that's Frank. Okay. Representative Costa is not here. Michelle Brooks is not here. Um, Acting Fire, State Fire Commissioner Bruce Tega. Trego. Bruce, are you going to say a few words? Yes, sir. Okay. A few words. Thank Great. you. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, working with some of the subcommittees, uh, both via conference call and some in person. Uh, I'm looking forward to some, some good results uh, and looking forward to the progress that this, this organization is doing, this committee is working towards. In the, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Great. Um, here for Michelle Brooks is Diane McNaughton. Did you want to say anything, Diane? No, I'm good. You're, you're okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, next, we have um, Mr. Ray Baraszewski, Deputy D Secretary for Health Planning and Assessment with Pennsylvania Department of Health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, a special thanks to Chester County for uh, hosting us today. My remarks will be really brief so we can get to the uh, subcommittee, the committees, excuse me. Um, I did want to let people know I think we've had some great conversations with at the EMS committee level and I look forward to additional conversations. The department appreciates being a part of those conversations. Um, we had recently extended an offer to a new state EMS director. He will be beginning on April 16th. His name is Dylan Ferguson. If anybody would like additional information about Dylan, how to get in contact with him, et cetera, or even getting on his schedule, please see me either at the meeting or reach out to me afterwards. I know he's reached out to a number of constituents across the state to get some perspectives regarding our very diverse EMS system. And to a, to a person, everybody's told me how he's been very well researched about the issues and how they look forward to working with him. 
I also want to just keep people posted. Um, the department is now has now over 90% compliance with our Nemesis 3.4 EMS data set. And what that means is if you need data in regard to EMS, <clears throat> Please reach out to the department. In the past, we may have had difficulty getting you data, but right now, we are at a place we've never been at before in regard to being able to tabulate and report out on EMS data. Uh, with those two updates being said, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say a quick thanks for allowing me to be here today, and I'll pass it right back to you, sir. Thank you. Also with us is Amy Britton, who is the um, Chief of Staff for Chairman Sonato, right? Okay. Um, also with me today is a, one of the representatives from Delaware County, Chris Quinn, who um, comes from the Middletown, represents the Middletown area of Delaware County, a, a town that is actually a legislative district that is very rich in um, firefighters and um, volunteer firefighters and, and the traditions that go along with um, being volunteer firefighters. Chris, did you want to say anything? Chris, Chris and I were talking last night. I was telling him about the meeting. He said he wanted to swing out and spend at least an hour with us. I know you have another commitment that you have to make at um, 11 o'clock, but we appreciate you, you being here. And um, Okay, thank you all for your opening comments. And um, now, we're, before we break out into subcommittee discussions, I want to thank... I want to thank you all for your participation in these subcommittees. I have heard some very positive reports on the fruits of your labor over the past several months, and your work is very valuable to, to the success of this SR6 commission. At this time, we will break out into our subcommittees into different areas of the room, and um, I'm going to look to Bo Crowding and Sean and Nate to direct us into where we need to go. And after we do the subcommittee meetings, we'll meet back and and then we will have um, we will have lunch. What's that? At twelve, we'll meet back in here. Yes, okay. done. Before we break, maybe it'd be a good idea to sort of have a global discussion on how to do that inventory of firefighters. I think it would save the crossfall for me. Great. And it would give us and, and maybe throw out a thought to start. And I'd like input from both Commissioner Mann and, and Commissioner Credo. Can it, can everybody hear Don? Come on. We want to grab the mic. It'll certainly help us with the recording. And Sean can't hear you, he said. That's a rarity that I can't be heard. But uh, um, <laughs> my suggestion was that we do, as a, as a global issue before we break into committees, suggestions on how to do the inventory of firefighters and EMS personnel statewide. Um, my suggestion sort of to start the, the discussion would be that we put a additional question on the grant form asking people where they were 10 years ago, five years ago, and currently. Um, the two commissioners have a better handle on how onerous that would be in terms of, of getting that on a, on a grant, but it's probably the only statewide survey that I can think of that goes to the fire service and most of EMS that would be reliable. Right now there's currently no questions on, on the grant application? It it's been three years since I looked at the grant application. Okay. Yeah. And I don't want to put Bruce on the spot. No, I, I agree. I mean, we, if we do an I inventory, believe, we want to make it. I as believe there's it. We asked for the pieces of apparatus, uh, and we asked for personnel, if I'm not mistaken, beyond just the number of people are, that are certified. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. I see a hand up back here. Just a comment on both fronts. Is that not going to cover anybody that? Oh, here we go. Here. For both fire and EMS, that's not going to cover anybody that's affiliated with more than one agency. They're Agreed. going to be counted multiple times. Agreed. Also, I had raised the very question about um, certified on the EMS front, certified personnel versus active personnel. And uh, the Bureau of EMS told me they can't pull up that data without running each individual separately. So I don't know if the Nemesis 3.4 90% will help that, but I would certainly hope there's a way to come up with that information from the Bureau. Mm -hmm. okay. the, uh, just to comment on, 
if you, we had this discussion this morning at breakfast, the uh, Pennsylvania burning, the numbers that they come up with in the 70s, I actually spoke to an individual who was involved with that project who visited every county in the Commonwealth and gathered that information. So that's how accurate it was then. Depending on how accurate you want to get, you're almost going to have to put somebody in a county that's going to have to go do that census for you. Because if you're dependent on, I tried on two different occasions as a fire commissioner to get the county EMA directors to provide me with nothing more than a list of, give me the station number and the name of the fire company in that county, and I may have gotten a quarter to a half of the counties to respond to it. Uh, a couple of times we had asked Pima to use the EMPG grant as the leverage as part of that grant that year. In order for you to get your grant money, you got to do this survey. And there wasn't any will to force the counties to do something tied to their grant money. So that never occurred. But depending on how accurate you want to get, I honestly think the only way you're going to get the accuracy is you're going to have to depend on somebody, boots on the ground in a county, to go do the census for you. Or you're never going to get the kind of in-depth, accurate information you're looking for. Uh, because you're, you're, you know, if we collect information on the grant, you could take the grant application that we have now and, and start with some basic stuff. But as I was telling Nate this morning, I have 17 active members in my department. Someone down the street might have a bar in their fire station and have 125 members, and 125 members are considered to be active because that's the way their bylaws are written. So if you want accurate information, Someone's going to have to be willing to spend some money, put boots on the ground, and go from county to county and do an actual hands-on census of what, what exists. I, I, I don't, if, if you want accurate information, there's no other way to get the accurate mm -hmm. information that you want. Because the rest of it is just going to be a scientific, wild guess. So I heard you're retired with nothing to do? I have plenty to do. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, if 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 the uh, amount of money you offer is good enough, we could negotiate. Un unli unlimited strombolis, would that work? <laughs> You'll come back chunkier than you are now. So, <laughs> um, back I'll, here, yes. I'll go for the stromboli. Uh, John Bast, I'm with the Training and Ops Committee, and we had a discussion. Last Thursday, uh, brief, but uh, same, same topic. And how are we going to count these people? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talked about the doing it on the grant. But then again, how are we going to, you know, dual me members that have dual membership in other organizations? And that was the hard part. Mm -hmm. And the other item that is only on the grant is you're only allowed 20, 20 members. Uh, that are certified. So if you have more than 20 certified members, you're losing half or however many you're having. Um, the, final, the final item is, you know, active yeah, the active versus uh, non-active, which Ed did bring up. So I think this is affecting everybody and it's a good idea to have this discussion Great. Over here. Um, uh, just uh, one of the questions you to add to the Wait a minute. Again, in defining that active, the question you need to ask is how many members, well, not to address the duplicate memberships. That's another thought that someone has to figure out that's very smart. How many members are certified to go in a building with an air pack on? That is the question you need. Right there. How, and that's where you start to drill down with that. And the question about active is how many respond to at least 10% of the calls? That, that's kind of a good number to start with. Okay. Over here, Charles. I was going to agree with, with all that said, and, and um, our committee is also looking at that. And, and uh, what we're talking about is actually going out and getting a survey of maybe from different fire companies and then break and doing some kind of analysis to 
come up with those numbers and get an estimate anyway. It won't give us a definite number, but unless, as you said, uh, former Commissioner Mann said, to, to get somebody out there, and maybe you do it by county. Maybe each person takes a county. I mean, you know, I'd be more than willing to take Montgomery County and, and hit, hit, hit every firehouse. Maybe we break it down that way and come back. But our, our committee is also looking at that um, inventory, and I, and I think it's, it's real important. You can't just say an, an active firefighter because as Ed said, you know, the, bar, the firehouse down the street has a bar and you've got 100 people there and the one he is 17. So uh, we need to break it down into categories and, and, and define what an active firefighter is. We keep focusing on fire if we're going to, if, if you're going to go to the trouble to put somebody boots on the ground in the counties, let's not forget EMS. Uh, I, I think you could get career EMS information easy enough, but the volunteer side of the EMS community is, is in as bad a shape in areas as is the fire service. So if you're going to go to the effort to put boots on the ground in a county, let's not forget EMS. Microphone. Wait, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, the first one is uh, I coordinated the Firemen's Association of the State of Pennsylvania's SAFER program for the past three years. We had a survey request at the start of this program. We got less than 10 percent of the fire departments in, in uh, the state that responded to that survey. We did uh, uh, subsequent training programs, and we had very, very little participation by the departments. So the communication of any kind of tool like this has to be wide and it has to be deep or it's not going to be very successful. Following that up, I was involved with a countywide study where only 22 percent of the fire departments in that county, which has about 100 departments, only 22 percent responded to a study that was actually going to help them. So again, without somebody actively going department to department, station to station, it's not going to work. So I full concurrence with what Ed Mann said about uh, you're going to have to have somebody in each county. So let me tell you someplace where they do this and where it works. In North Carolina, every fire department every year is mandated there the fire marshal's office is under the insurance commissioner the fire marshal has to validate that every fire station is functional is active has a minimum number of members and a minimum number of fire apparatus before they will validate them for the coming year and they have to do so much training every year they then have to log in how many firefighters they have that are certified, how many EMS personnel are certified, EMS has to go through the same system. So if I go to North Carolina to, uh, to work with a client down there, I'm given their roster for fire and their roster for EMS as soon as I walk in the door and we know it's current, we know it's valid, we know that they're fully trained. That's the kind of process that works, but it doesn't catch the dupes. In fact, I found one department, one county where one individual belonged to nine departments. So th there are some ways to do this that are successful, but even then, you still have the challenges. So without figuring that out, we're not going to get anywhere with this. Okay, so, <laughs> so Don asked me to just comment on I, I ran, oh, I'm Steve Bear, by the way, for uh, representing the Association of uh, Councils of Governments. I'm also the fire chief in State College. So that said, um, I, I ran a bunch of numbers using the data that's available to us through the Center for Rural Pennsylvania and the, and the series of studies they did through 2012 uh, was the last group of data. And that puts us demonstrably below the 50,000 number. And it does not account for duplicates, so I suspect you, you know, I suspect we're considerably lower than that. In fact, my estimates put us down closer to about 36,000, maybe, thir maybe 38,000, which is extremely low. As, I, as everyone was talking, one of the things I was thinking about sitting here was we may not be able, without a huge amount of work, I agree, you've got to put boots on the ground and go county by county. That's a huge undertaking. But one of the other things we might think about is we have Penford's data available to us. And most of the fire reports, if not all the fire reports, require the department to uh, 
uh, to report how many people responded to each and every incident. And we could come in and take a pretty good cut at that number and see how many actual active people are responding to emergencies, which at the end of the day, in my mind, is where the rubber hits the road. So we may have some other surrogate uh, data uh, opportunities to think about. I'll think some more, but PENFERS and, and ENFERS comes to mind pretty quick. I, I'm going to try to mine that. We'll see what we come up with. Anyone else? Oh, back here. Backing up what Steve said, uh, our county EMA office does a photo ID accountability system back in Schuylkill, so I can literally get a count of 105 volunteer fire company active members by that fo photo ID count. It will take a little bit more work to take out the duplicates, the uh, Velcro patch guys that run with nine fire companies, but uh, that information is available. So, so through our accountability system in our county, we can get that information. Right, did you want to? Oh, I did want to. Yeah, just as a follow up to what Steve said and Chief Bast, um, in our last conference call, one of my do outs was to check and see what we can do with the, uh, the PENFERS reporting. And it may be as simple as putting another field in the reporting for the number of people who are active for the year. Uh, it was my understanding, and I don't know emergency reporting or firehouse as well as what former Commissioner Mann is, which, which is why I certainly bowed to him to, to, to speak at this first. But I did want to let you know that we did do some follow-up on looking at how we can get at least the number of people that have responded through the year. At the present time, we can't give you the total numbers of each fire company. Does that make sense? We can, we can tell you how many responded during the year. And we're looking at, uh, Craig is going to work with emergency reporting to see if there's a way we can put another field in there to identify that. Bruce, are you able to tell us which system each department uses, ER versus firehouse? Because I or believe. Both of them, there's certain reports made. Yeah. If you're able to tell us which systems each fire company or fire department works with, um, you know, there, there are reports in those things. Right. Plenty of reports available that will give you numbers. And, and maybe we could identify a certain report and ask them fire companies to send them in to a certain committee or, or to their representative for that county and get the numbers that way. I mean, there's, emergency reporting has hundreds of reports, too many reports, so does Firehouse, but mm. that, that information's in there if you, if you can identify the... Uh, yeah, the, the only issue, I, I understand what you're saying, I shouldn't say an issue, what, what I look at there is the next dilemma, if you will, is those that do not do the reporting, you know, we, we had to enforce it this year, and we've, we've taken a lot of flack for it, that if you didn't start doing your, your reporting, you weren't going to get a grant. Now, some were legit reasons that they didn't do the reporting, and then others were that, well, you know, even though we told them for three years, by this date in, in, in 2018, it will be required, we still got hammered with, hey, uh, I didn't know I had to do it. You know, and, and I see you smiling, Ed. I know you went through the same thing. But uh, it, it would give us, on the plus side, it would good, give us a good basis to start with that we have at least a minimum number that we know we're working with. I, I, somewhere between... You're on. Somewhere between using the information that's in the grant program and what we're collecting with the PENFERS data, whether it's emergency reporting or firehouse, it would be a good starting point. And at the end of the day, I don't think any of us really care whether or not the XYZ fire company has 500 people on the rolls. I want to know how many people are responding to calls because that's, that's, that's what we're here for. I, I, mean, I don't care how many members add in the field to emergency reporting to ask that question is you're just you're going to agitate the end user okay because it, when you can't complete that report without putting the names of people so the total number of people that are responding to a calls or that that data is available and that's what's important to us as emergency responders you know, I, 
the fact that I have 17 people is terrific, but my average response on a call is six people. That's what's important. Having 17 members or having 700 members, uh, you know, ambulance services that have two and 300 members, no big deal if they still can't get an ambulance on the street during the day because everybody's working. I mean, that's, that's the important part of it. So I would think as a starting point anyway between PENFERS and the information that we request or get in the grant program would at least be a starting point. So if you look, and you could run, I'm sure you can run it by county because the data is there. And if you look at a county and it looks, well, hey, this doesn't make really a lot of sense. There's too many people or not enough. Then you put somebody on the ground in that county. Uh, but it at least gives you a starting point. Ray, um, for the EMS, you are required to have EMTs and paramedics licensed. How accurate is the data for our purposes in this discussion today with that information that you have? Our data is great. But the question goes back to what was being asked before, which is active. So we can tell you to a person how many certified providers we have, whether that's EMR, EMT, or paramedic. Um, the question becomes, and I'm writing down a whole bunch of issues right now, which is one of the things Ed just said. EMS agencies can say that they have, I believe Ed said 200, 300 members, I wish. Um, EMS agencies can say that they have or 20 or 30 members. But if none of them are active, or two of them are active, that's the difficulty. So what we're going to have to dig in on, which is what Craig brought up as well, which is how to get a determination on how many of our EMS providers certified in the state meet our definition of active. Craig, can you, can you search on how many people get accommodation on active and track that there? I can probably do that, but then the question becomes to that. Just because you did a continuing education class doesn't mean you actually got on a truck. But their, their certification is active at the time. So anytime you, you take a, a dip into your data, it's a snapshot in time. So it shows you who is actually certified at that time. And that should give you a relative number of folks out there who at least can get on a truck. So I'm hearing two different things. And the way I see it is... If we're looking for a number number, a number of uh, certified providers, that, what you just mentioned, gives us that number. And we can get that number. If we're looking for people who actually have gotten on a truck in, say, um, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, that number doesn't give us the, the number we're looking for. That number gives us this great number of certified providers out there, but when we're looking at active, and active also probably needs to be defined both on the fire side and on the EMS side, although I did hear, I think Jerry said 10% of calls. Did I put words in your mouth? So um, I don't know how we would define active, and maybe that's one of our charges as well both from both sides, but at the same time, we need to look at the providers out there who are truly active. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, just Bill. Bill? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Jack. Uh, uh, since Steve, since you have the microphone, <laughs> why yeah. You yeah. So just real quick, there, there, there are there are a couple of kind of points floating in here. I just don't want anyone to lose sight of. I agree with Bill Genoa. I think we should start asking these questions because one of the things we've got to change is this culture of of, of closed door, hold information tight to the vest nonsense that that is. I think ultimately destructive for the for the fire and EMS services as well as, as not helpful to the legislature or our local officials. The, the second thing is I would just remind everybody is we don't need pure numbers. You can have a statistically robust model without having 100 percent of the participation. We just have to run the math on that and figure out how much errors in the model. But we can we can I'm pretty confident that we we can come up with a good model. And maybe to Ed's point. Uh, some of our initial data will lead us into making that data collection a little more focused and efficient uh, in, order, in order to hit the statistical numbers we need to, to, make, the, to make the numbers you know, actually matter or count or be worthwhile. The last piece is, however we do it, there are a number of metrics we ought to be thinking about to figure out whether any of this stuff is going to bear fruit and is getting us where we want to go. And at the end of the day, I would agree with everybody's assessment that that's the number of people who are actually responding to an emergency incidents, how quickly they're responding to emergency incidents, and then what are the, what are the patient and property loss outcomes of those efforts. 
And that stuff's all pretty readily measurable. So I wouldn't panic too much. I think anybody would agree that whether the number is 50,000, 36,000, or 40,000, it's not near enough and we're in real trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Back here to Bill. I think we're going to break out right after, Bill, right after you're done. And if anybody needs to know what committee or where, where the committees are meeting, um, Bo Crowding will give you the um, um, rooms that we're going to be. Okay? Good, Bill. Sorry. Okay. Well, I think now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty, and I think Steve really started to hone in on something. So let me challenge this entire discussion. Why do we care how many firefighters there are? Why do we care if there's 20,000, 30,000, or 80,000? What we really should be concerned with is whether or not we can provide an effective firefighting force or an effective emergency medical response team that's going mm -hmm. to achieve a goal of arriving at a scene within so many minutes with the right equipment, be properly trained, and be able to do the job, whether it's medical, rescue, or firefighting. So maybe we don't care if there's 14 people in, in Ed's department Maybe we need to guarantee that there are four people available 24-7 and that those four people will respond in concert with the department next to him who maybe will have six people available in concert with the department next to him that has eight people. And now all of a sudden we've got an 18-person effective firefighting force that's going to be able to respond in 20 minutes and we're going to hit our standard of response cover. I think maybe we need to look long-term at what we did with SR-60 uh, where we established different standards of cover for different types of, of Pennsylvania, whether it was metropolitan, suburban, uh, rural, or remote. Mm -hmm. Okay, one, one last question here, if we can. Don, you're doing a fine job. <laughs> I think Bill's, Bill's right on on that, and, and I think we need to take that one step further. You know, we keep on saying also it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars to replace this volunteer fire service, and that's, that's just not true, the numbers we're putting out there, because we're using a mechanism that the National Volunteer Fire Council puts out that's replacing person for person and truck for truck. The fact of the matter is I've got seven fire companies in my township. If I was to go to a career department, I wouldn't have 14 engines and seven ladder trucks and seven fire stations. I'd have half of that. Mm -hmm. So we're putting out false numbers and that are kind of scary. So, so we need to take that one step further and put out the truth. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to cost us this. Not, you know, we're not, we're not going to replace person for person. Okay, we're going to break out into our groups, and um, those groups are EMS subcommittee, government support, innovation, recruiting and retention, regulation and codes, and training and operations. Okay, at this time I would like to call each of the six subcommittees for their reports and um, kind of a synopsis of their group discussion. The first committee that we will call up is the um, EMS committee. Do you guys have a chairman there? Yes. Okay. You're welcome to take the podium. Or you can have Frank's seat if you want to sit down here and just tell him to get up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We had a lot of, lot of issues on our agenda for today. We've been meeting regularly for over the last several weeks. Uh, and some of these have just come up today, but some of these were issues we've been talking about for a while. Uh, one of the things we, we just found out the other day was uh, one of our uh, ambulance services is still recognized as a relief association, but does not fit the current legislative definition of what a relief association can be because they are not affiliated with the fire department. So we're going to be looking at some, some language that might fix some of those issues. There's about 10, uh, I think 10 agencies in the Commonwealth that are, are 18, 18, thanks, Sean. There's 18 in the Commonwealth that are uh, also classified that way. Um, we had talked, <clears throat> we got some, some information for the MSOF fund distribution from the, the Bureau, so, so thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary, for getting that to us. Um, we are going to be looking at s drilling down in those figures a little bit more to find out how much of that money is being used for uh, direct support, how much is available for direct support, 
uh, and how much the, how that's been changing over the last several years. We we see it's really decreasing because the MSOP fund is is also decreasing as well. Um, some of the questions that we're going to try to find out where where to ask uh, for some of these MSOP fines and fees are these being waived in the court system, uh, and if they are being waived, how how is that affecting uh, total amounts uh, collected? Um, are there any other sources of, of funding that we can put into the MSOF fund, uh, realizing that the MSOF needs to be used to build the system, which is what most of the uh, agencies across the state are using it for now? Uh, one of the things we, we did talk about is the uh, fireworks funding is probably going to be coming into the MSOF fund this year for the first time. Uh, we might see some, uh, so not as much as, as next year, but we might see a, a pretty good amount of funding for that this year. But it, it, we're going to try to see how much that's going to impact the MSOP fund with increases. Um, we have some other, other issues that are currently going on. There's a treat no transport bill still sitting out there. We're hoping that gets moved before the committee report's done so we don't have to recommend that gets passed. Um, some of the things we're talking about today, uh, you know, how, how we're being paid for what we do that is currently uh, considered a non-billable service. So are there other options to pay for some of these things that we're currently doing as an industry uh, that's actually benefiting the patients and benefiting uh, hospitals and the insurance carriers that uh, we are currently not being able to be reimbursed for? Uh, of course, the Medicaid increase is, is, is still pending right now. We're hoping that's done by, its, by the time we, we put forth a recommendation. Uh, one of the things that came out today, uh, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, is a rural initiative, uh, a way to um, waive some of the requirements around uh, some of these rural services that are primarily staffed with volunteers. And is there a way that we can make that work where we may not have to wait an hour to an hour and a half for an ambulance, we may be able to make it work that we can get a, a minimum, uh, minimum staff crew out there, maybe to a different set of standards in the future. And one of the things that was brought up today was uh, currently there is no legislation to allow counties to form an ambulance authority to provide EMS. It is, it is the municipal levels or, or lower levels, but some of the rural services think maybe a, a county-wide initiative might be the best way to handle that and might fix some of the problems we're currently um, looking at. Um, we're also going to put together some more uh, requests, data requests to, uh, to the Bureau. Uh, for some of the National Registry pass rates for the past five years and try to break that down a little bit so we can determine is there a problem with students being able to test, um, is there a problem with preparation for student testing. Um, and that's, that's where we stand right now. Can we take questions? We sure can. The county, the county authority, ambulance authority, what, what are your thoughts? How would that be organized and do you, do you it sounds like a great idea, but would it would it actually create could it create a bureaucratic nightmare at some point? It's 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 possible. There's three um, three authorities right now in the Commonwealth. There are municipal based uh, ones in Altoona that I'm familiar with. Ones in uh, South I think two are in South Hills of Pittsburgh. Is that right, Don? Two are in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, um, and they're municipal based. They have a, they form their own board. One of the the advantages to having the authority pass a, a, um, a fee or a fine, uh, and they can, they can actually collect monies uh, that are otherwise non-collectible for some of these, from some of these services. Okay. So uh, could it create a bureaucratic nightmare? Possibly, but I think right now the three, so the three ones that are in, in the state work very well. Okay, good. Questions from the, anyone up here? Anyone? Yes, Bill. I'd like to make a comment on that one. Under SR 60, when we first prepared that report, this was developed and, and recommended as a result of that to do either districts or authorities. I know there's no interest in districts, but authorities do present an excellent option to give regions, for lack of a better term, the ability to form an organization that then can then look beyond that local uh, population-centered area and go to a broader area, look at a broader distribution system, and therefore balance its cost better by being able to determine what the gross cost is going to be allocated through some kind of an allocation system or, or fee-based system or, or whatever, just like you've done in southwestern Pennsylvania and, and Altoona. If you look at other states that do this kind of process, it works extremely well. And, and I think it would be worthwhile looking into that for potential adoption. 
And we may be able to generate some cost savings based on that because you, you're, uh, you can use, have less equipment, you can have a, a, a larger base of providers, uh, and it may help, help keep some of the costs down. The uh, County Commissioners Association, uh, there are some commissioners that are trying to forward that. Currently, uh, the, the law does not allow the counties to form an authority. So uh, we are looking at the uh, possibility of giving the counties the ability to do that, but not forcing them to do that. Uh, again, that would give um, counties that want to go into that, that area the ability to try and manage different areas of their county that have those volunteers, but they don't have enough wherewithal to pay staff uh, and be able to regionalize their, their um, ambulance associations. It, it, it's, it sounds like there would be efficiency in the management portion of it, but then again, knowing the, the ter territorial type of attitude amongst a lot of different organizations, then, you know, that's where the bureaucratic nightmare comes in. Um, but, but I would think there'd be huge cost savings in the, in the management area, especially in, I, I know we have my, the fire companies, I mean, the ambulance companies in my area have employed, um, their, 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 um, collection agencies uh, basically for trying to ch chase money for money that they're owed from the insurance company because of the failure of a direct pay system. One of the things uh, that it would give the ability for this authority, whether it was a municipal based or a county based, it would give them the ability to manage that money and and see whatever, where, where that's going to go. Uh, they could mm -hmm. Uh, manage it by contracting with the existing uh, ambulance companies and and taking that pay uh, and and giving it out and they could manage it on a per population basis a whole lot better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right other questions yeah I, I concur with everything <clears throat> excuse me that's been said regarding the, the use or the concept of the authorities, I actually reached out to our, our county commissioner, Chairman Perry County, and also the uh, EMA director for the county, and some, some good questions were brought forth to be considered, but I think the, the crux of this or the key with this is it needs to be an option, not a responsibility or not a requirement, mm -hmm. and an, an enablement that if, if a portion of the, the municipalities or a portion of the agencies in the county um, see it as an option or see it as, 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 a, as a solution, um, that it can be considered by the county. Um, I know it, with our county, much like the state does, the county is very, very quick to say, that's a municipal problem, we're not getting involved. Um, and I, I think that's been a recurring challenge. I'll tell you that I, I served as our EMS council president for the county for two years after being vice president for almost 12. And a consistent theme, staffing and money, I think that's what we're talking about in this entire room, is staffing and money with everything. And this is a solution for not only an administrative approach for regionalization, but also an operational approach that when you look at it from the county perspective, and I can speak to my county, instead of having eight agencies with 15 trucks, maybe we have one agency comprised of those eight agencies with six trucks, but six trucks that are staffed 24-7. Right. Anyone else? Right up here. <coughs> Jay. Um, I think the committee did some really good work here. The only question I guess I would have is the, the Medicaid reimbursements right now don't even cover 50% of the cost of an ambulance transport. In terms of volunteer and career, this is one way I think the state could really help dramatically. But if we can't get the legislation to move right now, what's the committee going to do to change that? to get it to move? I guess that would be my question, and I know it's a hard one. <laughs> at, this, at this point, all we can do is make a recommendation back to the whole committee. Uh, I would hope that it's something coming out of this committee would be looked upon from the legislature as being a priority that needs to be to work on. Um, you know, as EMS doesn't control their own purse strings, uh, Medicaid, that's another state agency. So we would need to get yeah, some okay. serious buy-in from, from, uh, from that agency. And I, I think they understand the, the situation. The whole problem is, is there enough money? 
One of the things we had talked about was, especially the, uh, under the treat no transport, there may be ways to realize savings to the whole system from us not taking these patients to the most expensive form of care, making a referral to, for this patient to go somewhere else, and saving that bill from the emergency department that can be reinvested back into the system uh, into providing the EMS services. Or we can treat that patient right on scene. They don't need anything further than that. But right now, we don't get paid for that unless we transport. So we're hoping to use some of those savings on the back end to fund some of these on the front end. Maybe that, that in and of itself will be helpful. Yeah, I'm just hoping that we can provide the legislature with the true cost of an ambulance call compared to what Department of Public Welfare pays us for that call. Jay, um, if I may, uh, one of the challenges we have with the treatment of transport and Medicare is we can't change Medicare. The feds have to do that because it's federal. So from that standpoint, you need the congressman involved to do that. <laughs> Secondly, Medicare or Medicaid has uh, some strings attached to it, which are federal. So it makes it very difficult for us as a state to make changes when we want to. Uh, however, with the treat no transport, we have some leeway there in, in getting the insurance companies, uh, making them responsible to provide that reimbursement when service is provided. But from the reimbursement standpoint for Medicaid, the only thing we can do is raise the amount of money we put in that line item from the state side, but we still have to get the uh, structure, structure changed at the federal level or the state level to get our, and Ray, correct me here, if uh, I need correction, um, the state plan has to change. So we have some difficulties, some hurdles we have to get over, but we gotta be, remember that a lot of this comes from the feds, so it really makes it difficult for us to, to make uh, change happen quickly in that regard. And there, there are some changes, there are some, some federal uh, initiatives to, again, go with a, a more of a treat no transport model for Medicare as well. That is gonna be a very big uphill battle because we're gonna have to be changed from a transportation entity to a I mean, if I get this wrong, a provider. We're going to be provi a provider of services. And believe me, finding additional Medicaid dollars is not going to be easy, especially with the expansion of Medicaid, um, bringing 700,000 new people into the system right. um, with, with really no guaranteed way to pay for it. Um, is, and unfortunately, Medicaid has the capability of eating the entire budget if, um, you know, if it continues to grow at the, at the rate it does now. So, uh, questions? Any more questions, EMS? One more? And then we'll jump to the next topic. Just remember, from, from a perspective for Medicaid, they can do the state plan amendment. They don't have to have HB 699 to do that. It, it's on, it behooves the DHHS to just do a state plan amendment and get the money. Uh, you just have to come up with the 15 million on your side. Mm -hmm. But there's no regular, or there's no statutory requirement that that bill needs to be actually go through, if they would just do the state plan amendment. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We may come back for additional questions at some point if we have time. Um, government support. Okay, so the com committee's been hard at work, a lot of teleconference calls, um, we're continuing to work on our action plan, uh, which takes into account the, the inventory of firefighters. We've been talking about that, discussing that. Um, we've also been, as uh, Senator Volkovich had asked, looking at the Office of State Fire Commissioner and recently had a conference call with um, former Commissioner Mann and, and Acting Commissioner Trego. Um, we feel that we need to advance a standard of cover that has flexible options in it that local governments uh, must adopt, uh, similar to what's in the SR-60. Um, we feel that the state needs to be flexible in allowing municipalities to govern their municipalities and adopt recommendations from the state, such as with, instead of forcing us to adopt the current sprinkler legislation or the fire alarm, uh, fire, alarm, uh, uh, re uh, fire alarm resolution that was put forth you know, several years ago allowing for three false alarms, I know, in my community, fire alarms are killing the volunteer system. And we, prior to the state putting that law into place, we had control. 
but you've taken control away from us and we can't we can't do anything about it um, training standards credentials need to be adopted however they should be flexible enough in order to to allow municipalities that they can adopt those uh, standards and credentials that are, uh, relate to their individual communities so that someplace in the middle of the state you know has different response areas than say myself with the high rises those kinds of things they wouldn't have to do that um, we're talking we feel it's probably a good time for all the chairs of the committees to get together and uh, start discussing some of the things that that we've been discussing indiv individually so that we're not duplicating our efforts um, so we, we should probably look the chairs to get together uh, soon and lastly most of our discussion uh, we had a lot um, on talking about how we sell the work of this commission to the legislation as a whole not so much those of you who are here because we know you care but um, you know in, in order that's fully acted on it and history shows that the, this information has been previously given to the legislation going back to 1976 in the form of Pennsylvania burning um, HR 148 and SR 60 and you know if we sit here and ask the question right now are we better off today than we were back then it's clearly the answer is no um, so we, we need to come up with a way and then hopefully those of you on the legislation can help us in, in get, making sure that we can sell this properly because there, there seems to be some frustration on the part of some of the members that we're finding all these things have been previously put forth to the legislation and just not acted on the, the low-hanging fruit has been done the things that are easy to do and the things that are harder are just kind of left and then we find ourselves coming back and coming back and we're losing more and more as time goes on so that, that's really about where we were I, I think I think there's a, a problem I, I know we've dealt with it over the years of trying to convince members of the legislature that they actually that our fire companies our, our, our um, ambulance companies need more money you can see how hesitant they are I mean we give 300 million dollars a year or to maybe 280 million dollars a year away to the um, um, horse racing industry and when I remember my first attempt at increasing the grant program from um, the current 25 million increasing it by 15 million dollars and taking some of the money from the horse race development fund um, I, I'll tell you what you you would have you would have thought that I was I was taking money away from starving children and and it was um, because there were members in our, our committee and members in our leadership are very protective of that industry and, and trying to find out where we can come up with additional dollars is the hardest part because, you know, it, it's it, – there. I have several companies in my district that are extremely well off, and I have some that are barely surviving. And I think members of the legislature don't want to believe that there are actually fire companies that are shutting their doors because they can't, they can't afford to stay open. And then a lot of people feel that, it, well, if, if you have a fire company in your municipality that's about to close – that's the municipality's obligation to try to keep that that company open, not the state's responsibility, which I disagree with. I, 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 I've, I've toyed with the idea of, of even talking to the governor and asking about a special session on this issue because I do believe that, you know, for most of our fire companies that a lot of them are in critical condition and we need to do more to educate the members of the legislature. That's why when we run these bills, we're planning to do a, a package rollout and try to draw as much attention from the press and, and the other and, and our citizens as possible on this issue. But, um, you know, it, it's when you look at all the other issues that are out there, especially now, you know, school safety, and I can tell you school safety and, and gun control um, is going to dominate um, our discussions coming back after um, when we when we come back in in um, April, May, and June, we'll probably uh, I'd be, uh, you'll be surprised at how much money they probably find for school safety. So I think it's important on all your your parts to educate your members and let them know how how bad um, things are. I mean, I hear numbers now. When uh, for years we've talked about maybe sixty thousand volunteers, and now possibly thirty five thousand or so. It's it, it's scary, but um, I don't know if Representative Ferry has any ideas on. No, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head because um, we have the list of 14 bills or, or whatever it is that came about 
um, prior to even this this uh, commission being formed, and also um, I think rolling them out as a package, um, you know, both the House and the Senate doing it simultaneously, I think is is win win and it'll draw attention to it. And I, I agree. Um, you have a tragedy like what happened in Parkland, and now we'll find the money to to address a lot of those issues. Um, but in the meantime, our emergency services are dying a slow death by going the way of the dinosaur. So um, I, I look forward to getting that addressed as a package. And then, you know, we can obviously follow up. To your point, we can follow up on um, the important recommendations that are going to come from this formal report, and, and that will be the next thing we need to jump on once we get those bills done. That's Okay. Good. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Sure thing. Next one is um, recruiting and retention. Who's our chairman on that? Oh, here he comes. Thank you for uh, coordinating the meeting for today and for uh, allowing us to express some continuing concerns about recruitment and retention. We began our session today by reviewing the items that were developed from the last two sessions and then tried to strategize a little bit looking toward what our next step in recommendations might be to you. Uh, but in doing that, a, a couple of things really began to rise to the top. One of them is that a, a single source for recruitment and retention support information clearly needs to be developed and maintained. There are, in Pennsylvania today, an innumerable number of grants that have been funded from the federal government through SAFER and, and FEMA. And as a result of those grants, you have counties or even individual departments who are operating their own little recruitment and retention initiatives those never get coordinated. The Firemen's Association has had one for the last four years, and Mr. Ozog and I just did a round of uh, working sessions with fire departments around the state, and I can tell you that two things were apparent. Apathy was one, in that local departments want somebody to do it for them. They don't want to do it themselves. And whenever they will be willing to do something, they want a complete package of information and product and tools to be able to do this with. Um, and in the uh, local level grants that the Farmers Association was able to offer, there were some great case studies. Those case studies were what we talked about in these workshops. However, those case studies need to go to the other 2,000 organizations who didn't send representation to these, uh, to these classes. So we need to find a single source way, and we have a thought on how that can be done, and that will be one of the, the recommendations we'll move forward from this. Another issue that uh, we spent a considerable amount of time on was the whole high school training issue. And I remember from SR60 when we proposed it then, there were some significant barriers that were presented from the Department of Education. They did not perceive fire and EMS training as being viable job opportunities and therefore weren't supportive of us doing these kinds of programs in the schools back then. Today, they have to understand that these are life skills and that just like health class and just like Math 101, people need to understand how to protect themselves in time of an emergency, how to use a fire extinguisher, how to be able to uh, do certain types of medical types of activities. These are life skills and, and we need to find a way to educate those responsible in the Department of Education to get these kinds of programs authorized. And there are good models being done at the high school and college level where you actually get credits for these kinds of activities. And I think it's one is even here. Is it Dr. Rara that has the program here or, or whatever school district has it here? So that's, that's another item uh, that we want to see move forward. Our next step would be to take the items that we've identified and build them into two different sets of recommendations. One would be legislative initiative recommendations that we think would be appropriate. The other would be administrative types of, of recommendations that may be procedural tasks. They might be something that could be done in some other form than legislation. And we'll try to find if there's a cost factor and a potential funding source 
for those. So that would be our next step that we would have uh, ready for you actually as a result of, of this meeting. So there'll be some key things. I don't think we're going to be comprehensive yet, but there'll be some key things there. Uh, and then pursuing those first 14 items, I went back and looked at them after, after you mentioned them, and uh, there are a number of those items that are recruitment and retention oriented. So helping, to, helping you to build this package, to move this package forward quickly would be advantageous to all of us. Thank you. Is there an innovation committee? Chairman? Okay. Hello, Jerry Ozog from Hampton Township Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, we've had uh, some, some great discussions, but I just want to uh, kind of, it's not going to be. Uh, I'm not going to read a whole bunch of stuff, but I did get some information that uh, I'll, I'll say this in some of our challenges, and this is what it's going to, going to come out to is, um, I'll quote this, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education estimates the number of high school seniors will decrease from, decrease by 2.6 percent from 2015-16 uh, to 2020-21, okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, Pennsylvania State Data Center shows the population from 2010 to 2040 is expected to remain flat. For the 15 to 34 age bracket, which is the primary age of volunteer firefighters, and you can say paramedic EMTs also. Um, the population of individuals age 65 and over is expected to increase by 66.4%. So the challenge we have, of course, is the state is getting older. There's not going to be a lot of young people. That's decreasing. And we are challenged with that demographic on how we're going to fight, uh, how we're going to fight this problem, which in our group we discussed that uh, the problem is now. You know, we could spend a lot of time and uh, uh, effort in doing studies and reviews and data, which is going to be important to convince legislators. Okay, obviously we need that data. But going on the assumption that the crisis is now, um, and by the way, we have to be careful with getting more money, and I'm not talking EMS, I'm talking specifically for fire, without basic organizational structure changes, you give companies more money, they're just going to buy more stuff and not fix, not deal with the basic problems of the organization. So what we discussed in our room and we, uh, in our area, and we also brought in a representative from PSATS and talked about that basic administrative structure and functions of volunteer fire companies and the struggle. People get into firefighting because they want to fight fire. And Tom Garrity from Philly talked very eloquently about that and the struggle they have keeping people in staff positions. And that uh, what can be done or possibilities of local governments helping out with administrative duties and incentivizing that somehow uh, to help volunteer fire companies. Uh, but what we did find, and, and in my personal experience, is healthy organizations will attract volunteers, and that has to do with great leaders and having good organizations with good processes and making it easy to volunteer. So with that, when we talk about innovation, we must have some sort of uh, options for different organizational structures. <laughs> may it be the county, may it be regions, may it be authorities, may it be ever. We need to have options where locals can make decisions on how they want to structure their system. Because like they all say, is if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to be talking about this five years from now, the population is going to get grayer and there's less high school students coming into the system. So we have major challenges. Uh, what I throw out to all the committees is uh, that concept of innovation. Uh, whatever you think is innovative, please send it to us because we've been struggling uh, with that concept of innovation. Um, that's all I got. Okay. Any questions? Questions? Yep. Very good. Regulation, regulation and codes. Good afternoon, James Slavinsky. Uh, is Jim Slavinsky here? Yeah, anyway, uh, we had our, our, our meeting and uh, when we all got done, we came to a realization, and we just kind of threw this out, that perhaps something we should consider at the state level is a 
Office of Public Safety. Uh, I must start at the last thing we talked about and work backwards. Uh, and it came about because we had a discussion about the authority or lack of authority that maybe a director of EMS has. And even when I was the fire commissioner, the conversation was, you know, what kind of relationship did you have with the administrations? A good example, and I, I, personal experience, you know, with the Ridge Schweiker administration, I had a pipeline to both the lieutenant go governor and the governor. And one of the deputy chiefs or the chief of staff was sitting in here with us today. And I'm not saying it because he's sitting here. As with the Rendell administration, not so much. Uh, everything was done with a deputy chief of staff for public safety. I rarely had the opportunity to address the governor in any way. Uh, and, and then you, you move along with the Corbett administration, it was the same way. If I needed to get something done, it got done with the lieutenant governor. It didn't get done through the governor's office. So the, qu the question becomes, we have these positions, but is there really any authority there, and do they have any direct pipeline to the administration to get things done? So perhaps you consider a Department of Public Safety where you have a public safety director, and you have a commissioner of the state police and a commissioner of fire and a commissioner of EMS and a commissioner of corrections. And that chairman or director of the, the Department of Public Safety is a secretary level position. Uh, just, I'm gonna throw it out because it came up in our group, okay? And I know it's been talked about before, maybe not at a grand, at a grand level, but it has been discussed before. So that was the last thing on the list, and I'll work back to the beginning. Uh, our friend from the Pennsylvania Association of Fire Equipment Distributors is here with us, and we all agree that there has to be some kind of standard put in place for individuals that are servicing fire extinguishers and installed systems. Uh, he uh, uh, informed me that they have a lobbyist right now that's working on some draft legislation, and I asked him if he would see that we got that so we can include it with our report to you. Uh, we talked about EMS, and Dave, if you would, if you think there's any crossover between things you're having and, and that we need to have within our report, please send them to me. Or we can just leave them separate in the reports, and Sean and them can figure out where the crossover is. Uh, the other thing we talked about, we talked about Act 84, uh, Fireman's Relief, and probably long term, I think the best thing, that our recommendation eventually is going to be that you either have the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee or the Joint State Committee, whatever that is now, take a look at Act 84 to see if there, there needs to be any changes to it. Uh, and, of course, we talked about MSOF and the MSOF money and the fact that it hasn't changed since 1985. And the money's, the, the, the MSOF fund, I guess, over the years has been raped to be used for other things. And now whatever's coming in is what's going out. Uh, I know in my conversations with several EMS managers across the state, the two things I've heard most from them was funding and people. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, they're, tr they're trying to pay people, but they can't give them a decent wage because the money's not there to be able to pay them. Uh, and you know, I know for a fact in my community, you know, I know of EMTs and paramedics that are working for two and three ambulance services, not because they love the job that significantly. It's because they got to do it in order to make a living. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I guess that it, it raises the question, and I'm not an EMS provider, but it raises the question, and I'll throw this, and I thought about it while Dave was giving his talk. Is EMS actually considered part of the healthcare system, or are they outsiders? It seems to me that we treat EMS as part of the healthcare system when it suits, but when it doesn't suit, well, they're not part of the healthcare system. They're part of the emergency response community, and as such, we shouldn't be treating them as healthcare providers. I, I don't know what the answer to that question is, and I don't know if anybody can answer it. Uh, I look at it this way: you know, it, it's they're an extension of an emergency room. Uh, you know, uh, so I I don't know what the answer to that is. Ultimately, what I'm waiting for is 
is Jeanette's going to get some information to me. My friend from PayFed's going to get some information to me. And when they do, I'll get it together in the form of a, a written report and send it over to you. And then you can tell me if we need to do any additional work with it. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Here we go. Hold on. Well, it, 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 Ed may not know the answer to it, but has anybody noticed the relief funds are going down annually that yeah. they're receiving? Does anybody know why? Categorization of the income. Yeah. I asked that question to the last state fire commissioner. And according to. We need a microphone. If you can hold on, please. We need a microphone. Thank you. Uh, again, Steve Bear from State College. So our relief went down 18% in the last five years, 8.7% last year alone. And so I asked then Commissioner Solobay what, what was driving that, and he reached out to the insurance office. They reported somewhere in the order of 7 million fewer policies paying into the fund. And it was his belief and uh, and uh, the belief of many of the folks over in the insurance office that this was driven by the fact that insurance companies self-report whether they are casualty companies or whether they are fire insurance companies. And so through a loophole, there are a lot fewer policyholders paying into the fund. And that needs to change. And frankly, from a legislative perspective, that's pretty low-hanging fruit. So I throw yeah. that out there. Yeah, because I've been trying to get the answer and we've been Got, we've gotten quite a bit of a runaround um, because obviously my own relief association has gone down. The neighboring ones are going down, and the question's been posed. So, um, Steve, you gave me more information there in two minutes than we've been able to get legislatively uh, through a legislative inquiry in about three months. Probably more obnoxious than you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, well, it, it is something – generally the back. It, it is something that we can try and get resolved, so – I believe another possible reason, most of your major uh, corporations that have land holdings are probably going to have some kind of a real estate insurance trust established, which is going to have some kind of a self-insurance program, and as a result, they're not going to be qualified under the, the guidelines for being foreign or, or domestic, so to speak, so they're not going to be paying into that system. I, I'd suggest you look into that also. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments? Can I see a hand? Okay. Uh, training and operations. Bow crowding. Uh, Chief Bast had to head back to Easton, so uh, I, I guess that's why we have a, a vice chair, so I can uh, keep presenting to you guys. Um, <laughs> And also, it seems like for the last group to go, everybody's covered a lot of the conversations that we've had in our groups. And, and I think, Chaz, you mentioned it's a really good idea that the chairs get together, I think, soon, at least on a conference call, so we can kind of um, – and, and it think, seems like every time we get back together, it's, it's you know, we're rehashing some of the same things that are they're validating that they're still important. Uh, and we have a whole laundry list, but what we're trying to do is focus into three items right now to focus on. Under training is a standard of training. Uh, having a minimum requirement established. Now, obviously, in the EMS side, uh, it's taken care of because if you want to act as an EMT, there, there's a standard for that. If you want to act as a paramedic, there's a standard for that. So we have to look at if you want to act as a firefighter in the Commonwealth, uh, what is a standard of training? And we also understand that needs to be staged. We just can't say as of this date, uh, this is where we need to be. We need to look way into the future. Uh, but at some point, we need to put something on paper so that we have a direction that we need to get to. The other one, I think, uh, number two under operations for ourselves, and it, it goes across the board as well, is that standard of cover. Uh, what do the municipalities expect to be delivered? Uh, what are the citizens? And I think that's a, a, a point we're missing sometimes is what does a citizen expect us to deliver? Uh, but then what, uh, what do the agencies, fire and EMS, expect they should be delivering and what can they deliver? Uh, so I think that kind of goes a, a, along a lot of the different groups. 
Uh, and three, we need to look at a fundamental change in the delivery of fire and EMS service in the Commonwealth. And I think that's a common thing that we've heard here. Uh, but how, how are we going to do that? Obviously, we keep finding Band-Aids to make it to the next day. Uh, but we have to start also thinking about that long-term plan uh, that as things talk, and as, as Ed Mann mentioned, even at, you know, the, the Office of Public Safety, um, that for somebody to be thinking, because, you know, we also have to include law enforcement in our discussions because they're a part of public safety as well. Uh, but we have to make sure, and, and, and as my director said this morning, uh, and, and I think a lot of us are afraid to admit this, and, and he's going around telling people that we're in a crisis mode. Uh, and it's, it's evident here in Chester County and it's evident across the Commonwealth from discussions that we've heard from people. The other uh, thing it's going to be is to validate how many people we have out there that are serving our communities and differ and coming up with a definition that says we need to know how many active firefighters or active public first responders that we actually have doing the job. Uh, and then try to get that information back. That, that, that's going to be a huge task uh, to do that. But I think that spreads amongst all the groups as well. And then the last thing, and, and this was a common message as well, is funding, training, and staffing. All three of those, uh, somebody said it's a three-legged step stool, right? Um, that, that, that seems to be, you know, our foundation. Uh, and without one of them and, and the municipalities or the, the response agencies or the citizens, uh, not being on the same page if one of those fail, uh, we're going to, and we're seeing that where we're not getting funded enough uh, through reimbursements that are not coming through or through municipal funding or lack of um, fundraising going on at our agencies, that they're all affecting that. So uh, that's where we are as a group. Uh, we, it, 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 this is a huge monster that we're trying to, uh, trying to figure out. Uh, and, and people have been trying to do this for a long, long time. I, 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 I you know, uh, we understand it's going to be an uphill hill battle, but I echo again, I, I think the chairs need to get together soon uh, and kind of come up with a, an overall game plan. So the information we're giving back to you folks is uh, and recommendations is something that we can move forward with. Uh, but it's not like we hand over these recommendations and it's like we're done. Um, we, we need to stay together as a group and, and work, move forward. Uh, and stay focused on it and not just say, okay, here, here's, here's our recommendations, let's hope something happens. So that's where we are. And, and that's exactly what we don't want to have happen to come, come out of this. I think one, one of the big, as, as you're talking, I'm, listening, I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, one of the big problems with our constituencies at home is this is, this is a service in their mind that has always been free, and now you want them to pay for it. And it's, I, I remember when ATM charges used to be um, totally free. You could, you, you know, everybody <laughs> advertised, and then all of a sudden they started whacking you with three, four dollar fees. There was a lot of opposition to it, but again, because of free market, people accepted it. But again, this is, this is a service that, that, you know, the concept of a volunteer fire company for free mm -hmm. operates. And, there, and, and, and I don't know how you educate the public that it just, it isn't free anymore. It's very, very expensive. A fire truck costs a million dollars today, and and a lot of people just can't can't embrace that. And and I think there's a, a long education process that's going to have to take place. I think our, our next meeting we, we will have probably our next meeting in Harrisburg. But there's a point in time, at least the committee chairman will come before mm -hmm. the our both the Senate and House committee to give their reports again, and then have a frank discussion with the members of the committee. And I think you'll find both the Senate and House committee, um, the people that are on our committees fight to be on these committees. They actually, you know, will, will pressure us to make sure that they get to come back because they want to be part of this committee because it, it is a, a great committee. We do good issues here. Um, and, and, and I know the members like it. But again, I, I'm just praying that this isn't something that in a year or two we look back and go, yeah, we did SR60, now we did XR6, and next will be HR60 and, and HR6, and, mm -hmm. and, and where, does it, where does this end? When does this finally get addressed? So I hope that's not the situation. And one of the things we discussed as well, and Chief Bass said it, it people believe that the, we deliver what Chicago Fire shows on TV, mm -hmm. that, that, that that's what they come to expect uh, out on the street. Mm -hmm. And I, I, 
we're in crisis mode that we're, we're not able to deliver like Chicago Fire does every week that they show that TV show. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether we're doing it with volunteers or career uh, or combination system, we, we have to figure out how we're going to answer the call. Whether we are volunteer or in a combination system, we have to answer, figure out how we're going to answer the call uh, mm -hmm. for get a fire truck or an EMS unit to your house. And a police officer. I mean, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Any comments or questions? Anyone? Yes, sir. yes, right here. Jay. I think we all take time off from our busy schedules, too. So even though elected officials, you're busy, you know, my boss is the mayor, and he says, where do you have to go today? What's that all about? You should be back home doing work. But I, I believe in this. But I, I look at what we're all doing here almost like the opioid crisis, all right? Five years ago, no one talked about it, okay? Now President Trump's talking about it. The governor wanted $10 million to fight it. We wound up with $5 million in the legislature. And... Our emergency services is in crisis, career and volunteer, okay? We all bleed the same color, whether we get paid for it or we don't, okay? We, 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 when someone dials 911, they could care less whether you're a volunteer firefighter or a career firefighter. They care whether someone's going to come to help them and know how to help them. The legislature figured out, as well as the federal government, how we deal with this opioid crisis, okay? And it, we're not winning the battle yet, but you all are changing laws in Pennsylvania to prevent the physicians from being able to administer so much. Us, the first responders, are, are the boots on the ground that's administering the opioid, the, the, the naloxone. You found money, we were in crisis with opioids, and you found money to help fix that. None of this gets fixed without a couple of bucks from the state, somehow, somewhere, but I think every one of this whole committee really is here today to try to help our Commonwealth be better. If New York City didn't have the finances when we got hit there in 9-11, okay, the world would be in crisis. You know, with the money that you put out with a $25 million grant program, that's an investment in our infrastructure so we could respond as a state if something happens here. So I just ask you, you know, that, you know, we talk about Pennsylvania burning, 1976 Milton Chap. A lot of those things, they're still the same issues that we have today. We never fixed. SR60, there was a lot of good recommendations. A lot of them we still didn't fix. But these committees, I think, did some admirable work to put together a package to take us into the future. And in our committee today, I forget which one it was, that said, how do we get the legislature to understand this? The legislature understood opioids finally after a while. Now the people are understanding it. And we have a, a, a yeoman's job to do it, to just educate all of our legislators how much in crisis the emergency response community is in Pennsylvania. I agree. Great comments. Anyone else? Comments? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I know. This. Nate? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, just a couple things here, real quick, uh, before we end. Uh, Senate Resolution uh, Six uh, is is intended to expire at the end of June, as as we've stated before. Senator Velakovich has introduced Senate Resolution Two Hundred and Sixty. It came out of his committee here uh, last month. It's before the Senate here. So when we come back, we're expecting to uh, pass that, adopt that, and have it go over to the House, and then ultimately that would extend the commission to November 30th. So right now we're under the, the June 30th deadline. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if something goes wrong here with, with the with SR 260, here we'll, we'll get this uh, expedited here. But otherwise, we are, we are on track to make this into a November uh, 30th. Um, if I could see after the meeting, if, if the, the chairs could come up here and we'll work out a date here for a conference call, uh, my office can help set that up here, and right. if we can do that next week, you know, next Tuesday, look at your schedule right now for next Tuesday. We'll talk about that right afterwards, and then uh, um, also, uh, as the chairman indicated, we'll, uh, the next meeting, we're going to look at the end of May. I don't have a date here yet, but we'll, uh, we'll work amongst our staffs here to, to come up with a date, whether it's in Harrisburg. We're also looking at meetings uh, down the road here in the north, northeast as well as uh, southwest, so we'll, we'll be in touch on those fronts. Thanks, Mr. Okay, chairman. great. Um, going back to what we covered today, does anyone have questions where we are right now, what we've covered today? Okay. If not, and you can always email us if there's something that you think of on the way home or 
in the next couple of days. If you'd like to email us, we believe me, we, we share everything between the House and the Senate. And um, the resolution, the extension of the resolution that um, um, Nate was talking about, believe me, we will, the House will move it immediately after we receive it from the Senate, try to get, try to get things moving. I think the spirit of cooperation between the House and Senate as far as our committees go is a lot greater than it's ever been. And um, I, I absolutely enjoy working with Senator Volokovich. He's a, and so do our, our staffs work well together. So I believe that we will get um, maybe not everything done, but we'll get more done than we did out of SR60. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for your participation um, here today. And um, I think it was an excellent um, discussion with a lot of key, key issues. And um, I think we're moving the process along pretty good. Are there any comments for the good of the order? No? Okay. Hearing none, um, this meeting stands adjourned. Okay, turn things over to Bo. Bo Crowding, right. He's going to talk to quick us. Quick instructions if you're interested in a tour of the facility here. Uh, the academic building that you're in here today, uh, we have an alternate 911 center. We also have a tour of our disaster city okay. tactical village down back where we set buildings on fire and the cops do things. And then we just opened our new indoor law enforcement firing range. Uh, that's more than just a range. There's classrooms. There's uh, um, uh, driving simulators over there and different stuff like that. So uh, we have folks out here in the hallway. We'll probably split you into four or five person groups if you're interested in going on tours. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming out and uh, enjoy the tour and uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.